I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's all pray. We thank you, our gracious God that you gave to your servant John such a glorious vision of the risen Lord Jesus Christ in power and majesty in heaven. We thank you that you've given us in your word to believe that it is to this one who sits in the midst of the throne of heaven that we come this morning with the praise, worship and adoration of our hearts. We long, Lord, for the enabling power and presence of your Holy Spirit that we might worship you aright as we ask it in his name. Amen. In this morning from the book of Genesis in chapter 5 and then from Revelation in chapter 12. Genesis in chapter 5. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of, that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters, so all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years, and begot Cainan. After he begot Cainan, Enosh lived 115 years, 815 years, and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Cainan lived 70 years and begot Mahaliel. After he begot Mahaliel, Cainan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Cainan were 910 years, and he died. Mahaliel lived 65 years and begot Jared. And after he begot Jared, uh, sorry, Jared, Mahaliel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalahel were 895 years, and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. 
After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word that speaks to us of the beginnings of our race. We've, Lord, seen how our first parents fell, and now this litany of names, and he died, and he died. And so death has spread to all men. We know, Lord, uh, what a terror it is. But we bless you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, life and immortality has come to light through his gospel. He is himself the resurrection and the life, and we find hope only in him. We thank you for the promised seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. And our confidence is in this Saviour to deliver us from death and to bring us to eternal life. Amen. And we read from Revelations, uh, the book of Revelation and chapter 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the power of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who in who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly to the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed, out, uh, spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, we turn again to uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 and following and our studies in uh, the conflict that every Christian must uh, endure. A fortnight ago we began to look at the passage which is the classic statement on spiritual warfare to which we're all called and we began by looking at the sort of uh, basic fact of this warfare, the fact that every day of our lives as Christians, as the Lord's people, we face fierce opposition from the powers of darkness. And uh, we have to engage in spiritual battles with 
the devil and that Satan uses all of his cunning, all of his wiles uh, to bring believers back under his dominion and under his sway, into his clutches. And we've seen how the Apostle Paul defines the opposition we face in a particular way. We're not struggling, he says, against flesh and blood, but against the personification of evil in the person of the devil. We're in conflict with the evil one. And he's given some impressive titles through the scriptures called the God of this world, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, or just the enemy, the accuser. So throughout scripture we find that the apostles and others uh, are drawing on various pictures to convey to us the fierce reality of the malignant power of the devil as he opposes every believer. He's called a fiery dragon, we read earlier, didn't we, from Revelation. Uh, a roaring lion, a serpent, a liar, the deceiver, or even an angel of light. He's the accuser of the brethren. He has dominion over the spiritual hosts of wickedness. But having said all that, here in Ephesians 6, Paul wants us to be aware not only of the devil's existence and his wiles and his power, but his particular concern in Ephesians 6 is to show us how we may conquer the evil one. He wants us to live as more than conquerors through him who loved us. And with that in view, he describes for us the armour of God in which we are to be clad if we're to overcome the devil. Now we considered three elements of the armour last week. Uh, the belt of truth of which Paul speaks there in verse 14. And the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes or the boots of the gospel of peace to give us uh, stability and mobility in service and warfare. And today we're going to look at some of the remaining uh, pieces of armour and you'll see that there are three groups of, of three uh, pieces. First there's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of the gospel of peace. And then there's another group of three here. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit in verses 16 and 17. And this morning I want us to look particularly at the first of that second group. Uh, the shield of faith. Now, it may be that the Apostle's making a bit of a distinction here in the way in which he puts these things, that the first three pieces of armour we are to have on all of the time. And so he speaks in verse 14 of having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breast of, uh, breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel and so on. And then in verse 16, he speaks of taking the shield of faith and taking up the helmet of salvation and taking up the sword of the Spirit. So it seems there may be a bit of a distinction there in the way in which uh, Paul is expressing these things. Uh, so a soldier on active duty, uh, when he is resting may be able to stand some time out of the conflict, but ready for conflict, wearing a belt of truth and the breastplate and the shoes. And then when the alarm sounds, when there's an attack and he has to, uh, he's called to arms, then he takes up the helmet and the shield and the sword and so on. Maybe, maybe there's something in that uh, distinct difference of, of wording. But this morning I want us to think about the shield of faith. The shield of faith, a very special piece of the armour. And uh, Paul distinguishes it with the phrase, beside all these things. Or above all, taking the shield of faith, verse, verse 16. Uh, in, in effect then, Paul is saying, above all, you take this indispensable piece of armour this indispensable addition, the shield of faith. And he seems to set it apart as something of special importance in the life of the Christian and in the Christian life. And the shield did have a special significance, if for no other reason than its size, its sheer size. It wasn't like the little round shields carried by 
uh, gladiators or the larger round shield carried by uh, Vikings or the chevron carried by medieval knights. Uh, it was the size of a door. And the word actually means a door. And the shield is also especially emphasised by the apostle in that it's the only piece of armour that has a function ascribed to it here, to ward off the fiery darts of the enemy. Now obviously we need to think about what these fiery darts are, shot at us by the evil one, and we need to think about how it is that faith is a shield against those fiery darts to defend us. So the fiery darts, uh, it's a reference obviously to ancient warfare uh, in which arrows and darts were wound around with some combust combustible material and before it was shot uh, at the enemy it was set on fire so that when it hit the target it not only pierced the target like an ordinary arrow would but it also set fire to the target. So it would be covered in pitch or some other flammable material. Here the Apostle Paul describes the devil's attack upon us as coming so swiftly, you hardly know where it comes from. It comes like an arrow, and it not only pierces, but it burns, it inflames. It's a very vivid picture of the reality of satanic attacks. Remember how uh, John Bunyan, in his famous work, The Pilgrim's Progress, describes uh, Apollyon coming at him uh, with flaming arrows and darts flying at him from every direction. We tend to speak of our passions burning, don't we? Uh, we may describe someone as burning with anger and we know what that means, like a fire burning within and it flares up and we can barely control it. Our anger is red hot or jealousy can be like a fire. Um, burning with jealousy. Or we can burn with lust, the Bible says. Or we can burn with hatred. A dart, suddenly it comes and it sets fire to our passions like that. Now very often that takes place in the realm of our thoughts and our imaginations. Our thoughts can be set on fire and as we know fire is destructive. We might tame or control fire for warmth or whatever uh, and make it useful in that sense but once it's out of control we know that uh, its very essence is to consume and to destroy and in the spiritual conflict in which the Christian engages the enemy of our souls the devil sends his arrows with this single intention to consume and to destroy his aim is to set our imagination aflame on fire and he does that in all sorts of ways so that it becomes very destructive to us the imagination a wonderfully creative gift from God but the devil knows how to set it on fire with the fire from hell and to make us make it a destructive influence in our lives sometimes the battle comes like waves there may be a lull in the battle and then the intensity of the fighting increases and we find ourselves almost overwhelmed. The enemy may seem to retreat, go to ground, into his trenches and then suddenly there's a charge uh, as he launches a renewed attack on us and the fight is on again. We've all experienced such things as Christians. That is how it is in spiritual conflict as well as in warfare in the world around us. A lull in the battle does not mean that the war has ended and that it's all come to an end. Uh, suddenly we can find fiery darts shot at us uh, or many darts coming from many different directions. So let's try to understand how that comes about. What is the process of that? It's important to realize, I think very important to realize, that the devil has no access to your mind. Your mind is a closed, integrated system. He cannot plant thoughts in your mind. He cannot plant insinuations and blasphemies into your heart and mind. Your thoughts are your own. Now, in some respects, that's a frightening thought, isn't it? 
because you know that some of your thoughts are very dishonoring to God. But it's important to remember this, because what it shows us is that we can direct and we can control our thoughts. Sometimes we might be aware of an unworthy or a base uh, thought arising within us. That thought is our own. We're responsible for it. But the devil is the god of this world, and unbelievers are under his power and do his bidding. They serve him even unwittingly, and through the activities of ungodly men, some denying the faith, some giving vent to their lusts in the various branches of the arts and the media in which we are living day by day, some merely out to ridicule Christianity. In, in these and countless other ways, ideas are presented to our mind in forms of temptation, and we are drawn away then by our own lust and enticed. It may be a documentary on the television, perhaps uh, something about cosmology. There was one on just this week talking about the greatness of the universe how vast it is, how tiny the earth is in comparison to the universe in which we live, and then how insignificant human beings are in the light of all of that. And before you know it, you're asking yourself, well, if that's so, can the Bible really be true? Is God really interested in a human being on such a tiny creature, on such a tiny planet in the size of this vast universe? What's the rest of the universe for? And we find these unbelieving thoughts invading our hearts. How did those thoughts arise? Where did they come from? Well, it wasn't that the devil dropped that thought into your mind, uh, that you were powerless to prevent it happening. If that were possible, if you think about it, if, if it were possible for, for the devil to do that, well then the church wouldn't have survived the first century, would it? He could have destroyed the church like that, simply by putting unbelieving thoughts into the hearts of God's people. We're taught by Scripture to test the spirits, see whether they be from God. Well, how do you test a spirit? How do you do that? Well, John continues, test the spirits, whether they be of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. In other words, evil spirits uh, the evil one presents his temptation to you and to me through the activity of the subjects of his kingdom. False teachers, pornographers, philosophers, virulent atheists, idolaters, an unconverted aunt or sister, through a lecture, through a film, through a documentary, through a comedian, and you take in the thought, and sometimes immediately, but often very much later, that thought is resurrected, and you begin to mull it over, and it begins its destructive work. So you might be going through a difficult time. It might be tough, and uh, suddenly the ridicule and the arguments you've been exposed to in the world begin to take their effect on you, and you begin to think, is God really good? Is he really powerful? Is he really as the Bible describes him? Or is it all a big con, and how can I know if it's true or not? Uh, how do I know if what I've thought, and what I've thought I've experienced, isn't just a, an overactive imagination? How can I know? And that can become a flaming thought that burns away within you, destroying your sense of peace and upsetting you and unsettling you as a Christian. Those things are very common experiences. If it's happening to you or if it's happened, you are not unique. That is a very common experience. Maybe blasphemous thoughts, denials of the faith, denials of truth, like fiery darts suddenly inflaming us, suddenly uh, a smouldering, something that's just been smouldering away there in the background, and suddenly gets fanned into a flame. Fiery darts. 
Maybe that that's what uh, Peter is referring to in his epistle when he talks about the fiery trial. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you. And then later he describes the devil, as you know, as a roaring lion seeking uh, whomever he might uh, to devour. Resist him, says Peter. Resist him. Steadfast in faith. Now there is this need for the shield of faith because of the fiery darts of the evil one. He aims to set your passions on fire, to fill your mind with doubt and insinuations against God, uh, casting doubt on the character of God and the nature of the work of grace in your life. If you're a Christian this morning, those are fiery darts and they're very real and we're very vulnerable to them as the devil manipulates the world and the flesh, his two great instruments in which he works against us. These are avenues of his approach to us. It's through the opposition of a hostile, unbelieving world and through our failure to mortify the flesh as the devil presents his temptations to inflame our indwelling sin. Flesh is to be mortified, is to be put to death, isn't it? As we respond to God's call to be distinct from the world, to be a holy people separated to him. Well, what then is the shield of faith? How is it protective against the attacks of the devil? Faith acts as a shield against the fiery darts of the devil, principally because it is, in essence... Uh, pointing us away from ourselves to God. That's the essence of faith. Away from self to God and to all that God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, and for all that God is in himself. That's the function of faith. The function of faith is not to draw attention to itself. The function of faith is to open our eyes, the eyes of our understanding, that we might see the glory of all that God is to the believer and that we might grasp the wonder of all that God has done for us in Jesus, his Son. Now, the reason why this is such a crucial issue and why it's crucial that we understand it is because even many Christians talk about faith in ways that are quite unbiblical. We have to think about faith in the right way. For many people, having faith is little more than a sort of Christian form of optimism. Uh, You'll have heard people say things like, Oh, I wish I had his faith or her faith, that I had faith like them. I wish I had more faith. I wish I had stronger faith like this person. And implied in such ideas is the thought that we can work up faith ourselves. But that isn't how it is at all. But the focus of the Bible is not upon faith itself, but upon the object of faith, which is God. Perhaps one of the most notable examples of that error in the lifetime of of, uh, most of us here would be the writings of Norman Vincent Peale and his book entitled The Power of Positive Thinking. It was very influential last century influenced a lot of people. Now, not everything he says in the book is is wrong. Some of it is helpful. But you see, what he was writing about was not faith. He was writing about a certain attitude. He was writing about having a positive attitude to life. And that's the view of faith that so many of the religious teachers on television have today, having a positive approach to the difficulties and the trials of life and of course, it's, it's much healthier for us to exercise a more positive attitude to life than it is to exercise a negative attitude. The problem is that Vincent Peale referred to that as the shield of faith. And in that, he's wrong. This is what he says. When the Bible refers to the shield of faith, it's teaching us of a spiritual power technique, namely faith, belief, positive thinking, faith in God, faith in other people, faith in yourself, faith in life. This is the technique. 
And he goes on to say that when you get up in the morning, you should look in the mirror and say out loud three times, I believe, I believe, I believe. A follower of uh, Norman Vincent Peale uh, writes, when you get up in the morning, you should look in the mirror and say, I am a beautiful gift of God to the world today. I feel terrific. Now, frankly, I suggest that for most of us here this morning, if you want encouragement in the morning, the last place you want to look is in the mirror. But you see the error of what they're saying. They're looking into the mirror for encouragement. They're looking at themselves rather than, as we find in the Bible, the God of the Bible. The scriptures nowhere call us to have faith in ourselves or to have faith in life. The scriptures call us to put our faith in God. But the error is that these people are putting faith out there as a sort of psychological help, some kind of psychological process or quality, so that you look into the mirror and you say, I'm, I'm a great guy. I'm a great blessing to the world today and I'm God's beautiful gift to everybody else. Incidentally, Norman Vincent Peale was the pastor of President Trump. But you see, the Bible, in the Bible, the all-important thing is not faith, but the object of faith. It's where you put your trust, it's where you fix your trust that matters, in whom you place confidence. And that's what Paul is speaking about when he speaks about the shield of faith. It's the Lord who is the shield of his people. And faith brings us to rest our faith in him. And it's in the light of that, the one, one commentator, as he reviewed Norman Vincent Peale's uh, book, said, I find Paul appealing. I find Peale appalling. You see, for Paul, the object, the only object of faith is God, as he's revealed to us in Jesus. Faith focused on God's unchanging character and upon God's mighty works, chiefly in the Lord Jesus Christ and principally in his death on the cross. And the significance of faith is that it fixes itself and it hides itself in that. It hides itself in God, the rock of ages. It hides in Christ as the sufficient saviour for sinners who trust in him. And that's how the devil's arrows in, in every form and in every sphere are turned away from us because God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. And Christ is a saviour and a rock to me and therefore whenever a, an accusing thought arises in my soul, I hide me, Jesus, in thy name. That's what the Apostle Paul is speaking about. The whole idea of faith in Scripture is that of resting, of taking refuge in God. There's a great illustration of that, isn't there, in the life of Abraham, laid out for us in the Old Testament in Genesis 15. Uh, Abraham has fought a great battle against a confederacy of five kings, and he's been victorious in the battle, even though he wasn't a warrior. He hadn't undergone any kind of military training, but God gave him victory in the battle against those five kings. But after the battle, we read that Abraham was struck with the burning arrows of doubt and fear. And uh, he's filled with uncertainty and anxiety. And the word of the Lord comes to him at that time in a vision. Uh, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? In other words, he's saying, did God really mean what he said? When he promised me a son? Uh, will he be faithful to that promise? I remain childless. Was it all my imagination when I thought God had uh, come to 
give that promise to me? Was it all my imagination that God gave me this victory against the five kings? And Abram said, Lord, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So he held up the shield of faith, as it were, in the face of all his doubts and fears, his anxieties and his unbelief. Abram, as it were, was, was uh, saying with Wesley, all my trust on thee is found, all my hope uh, from thee I bring. Cover my defenceless head with the shadow of thy wing. Abram was lifting up the shield of faith, and that's what we have to do. Sometimes we have to do that suddenly. We need to do that as the psalmist so often do, calling on the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the scriptures say. And we have to call on the name of the Lord. And I suspect behind, that behind those sudden calls that we find in the, the Psalms, uh, as they are calling out to God, I think behind many of those there was a fiery dart being assaulted in soul and mind. They're crying out, Psalm 12, help Lord. We find it again in Psalm 16, preserve me, O Lord, for in thee I take refuge. Psalm 54, save me, O God. Psalm 120, in my distress I cried to the Lord. Deliver me, O Lord. The Psalms, you see, are so rich in their understanding of the ways of God with his people. They are men using the shield of faith in the time of trouble, calling on the name of the Lord. That means taking refuge in the unchanging character of God. But before you can do that, you have to know him. You have to know God. Because you cannot take refuge in a God you do not know. You have to know him. And that's why consistently, conscientiously, we have to commit ourselves to the Holy Scriptures. Because it's sure that we come to know him in the way in which he's revealed himself to us in the pages of scripture. And then when we're under assault, we can flee to the God of the Bible, the name of the Lord who is a strong tower, the righteous run unto it and is safe. But then we must also use the shield of faith in terms of our confidence in the absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Because that so often is where the battle rages in our experience as Christians. When that happens, when you begin to think, well, how can I be a Christian the way I live my life? You have to look to Jesus. There was a song sung years ago when I was a lad, Calvary covers it all. And that's true. We have to look away to Jesus Christ. We're going to sing in a moment. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress, midst flaming worlds, in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head, bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay, fully absolved through thee I am, from sin and fear and guilt and shame. Do you know what it is to hide yourself in this all-sufficient Saviour, Jesus Christ? He has defeated the powers of darkness. He has freed us from those powers and delivered us into the liberty of the sons of God. And Jesus takes his liberty and gives it to his people. So Paul can say, thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, taking the shield of faith, placing all our confidence in God and in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Not looking in, but looking out and up, using the shield of faith against the fiery darts of the enemy. Will the Lord help us and bless us. Amen. <laughs>